our daughters less pocket money than we pay our sons? In Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Great Britain, studies consistently show that from the age of five, we have a gender pay gap. So who in the audience has kids? Hands up. And of those of you that have kids, how many of you pay them pocket money? And of those of you who've still got your hand up, how many of you pay your daughters less than you pay your sons? Interesting. And this is the challenge of gender equality. Either we're not quite telling each other the truth, or possibly we have 600 of Australia's greatest feminists who've conducted a gender analysis of their pocket money situations in the room. Or we actually, as a community, haven't given this a lot of thought. And this might be the first time we've actually considered whether or not there's a difference in how we pay and support our daughters versus our sons. Over the course of their lifetime, our daughters will earn around a million dollars less than our sons. Our mothers in this country are 50% more likely to live in poverty in retirement. And our sisters continue to be paid 17.5% less than our brothers. And yet when you talk to rooms of people, whether that's conferences like today, whether that's boardrooms, whether that's staff meetings, and ask people the question, is it you that doesn't support women rising through the ranks of your organisation and taking a senior leadership role? Is it you that pays women in your organisation less than men? Magically, the answer is always no. So we're either lying to each other, we're lying to ourselves, or we've actually become so complacent as a society that things like pay equity don't really even occur to us that much. And we just become comfortable with the fact that it's probably all OK. And it's nearly OK, so that's probably enough. And what I'd put to you today is that gender equality in this country might be the greatest leadership challenge that we face. I grew up and was one of those young women who absolutely believed that I could have it all and was pretty confident if I kept my head down, worked hard and didn't get noticed as a female, I'd just get there on my own. But working in a job like the one I have, in an organisation like UN Women, you become acutely aware of the challenge of gender equality. And once you become aware, you become increasingly uncomfortable living in a world that values girls fundamentally less than it values boys. At its extreme, this manifests in countries like China and India with the killing of girl children because it's simply considered to be such a huge fundamental mistake to have a daughter. In countries like Australia, it manifests as the gender pay gap. It manifests as persistent violence against women. And it manifests as women not having the same access to choices as men. And for me, that's what gender equality is all about. It's never been about having it all. It's been about having access to whatever it is that women want to have access to, to having equal access to the choices that are available to men. And as I think about this space, I think about the fact that we have a service sector that's fundamentally underfunded. Do we need more government support? Absolutely. We have a school and education system that continues to support gendered stereotypes and perpetuate the role for girls and the role for boys. Do we need to challenge that? Absolutely. We have a work structure that fundamentally is built on the model of having a wife at home to support you in order to be able to take on a leadership role. I know I'd like a wife at home to support me sometimes, but that's not the way our society operates anymore. And so we absolutely need to change some of those fundamental structural things that impact the way we operate as a society. But what I'd put to you today is that change is too slow. And if we don't do something dramatically different today as a result of being here at TEDx, then it's going to be our granddaughters' granddaughters who might reach equality in their workplaces. Might. And if you're comfortable with that, then you can stop listening and you can 
take away from today that we've got a bit of a problem, but we're on track to fix it slowly. But if that makes you, like it makes me, feel more than a little uneasy, then what I'd suggest to you is we've got to do two things differently. We've got to get businesses to force a change through their supply chain. And we've got to get individuals, like you and I, to start making decisions based on supporting companies and organisations that are promoting gender equality. So how do we make this happen? Imagine if one of Australia's big banks said, we're no longer going to use suppliers that don't meet our minimum gender standards. So the tens of thousands of dollars that we spend on legal fees each year, we're now going to give to the company that can guarantee that it's promoting and supporting women in its workforce. We're going to use the stationary contractor that can show us that it is actively taking steps to empower women. And we're going to use the recruitment companies that can guarantee that they're going to put forward female candidates for every role. Now, many of you are probably rolling your eyes and thinking, well, that's never going to happen. But it did happen. It happened so quickly, we almost didn't see it happening. It happened so unanimously, we almost can't remember a time before it happened. And it happened in the environmental protection space. All of a sudden, we had green banks. All of a sudden, that fabulous white, glossy paper, which we all prefer, is no longer available. And even if it was available, it would be totally unacceptable to buy it because there's now the environmentally friendly option sitting right next to it. All of a sudden, every email had one of those little green trees at the bottom that said, please consider the environment before you print this email. And just as a side note, I often wonder whether if I put a little pink or purple woman under my email that said, please consider the 51% of the population that you haven't been considering for the last 100 <laughs> years, whether that might break a change. But my point is that in the environmental protection space, businesses drove a huge social and behavioural change through their supply chain. Did it cause the world to fall apart? No. Did costs blow out? Did companies start picking up contracts with absolutely no skill or merit? No. What happened was we changed, we adapted, we did it quickly. And what I would argue is that while gender equality and environmental protection are obviously not the same, they are both about the societies that we want to live in. And possibly more importantly, they're both about the societies that we want our children to live in in the future. So at an individual level, for me there's very little in life that doesn't come back to the Tim Tam. We all eat them, we all pretend we don't eat them, and we all send them across the world to our friends and family who are homesick. But the Tim Tam for me symbolises something much greater. It symbolises the power of individuals and NGOs to come together and force a business to change its decision. When a group of individuals found out that Arnott's couldn't guarantee that the chocolate used to cover the Tim Tam was coming from ethical sources, they started a letter-writing campaign. They wrote to the media. They got one of the major NGOs in Australia involved in saying, we as a society are actually not going to accept that one of our favourite foods, and a staple food group in this country, <laughs> is actually taking advantage of the lives of people overseas. And sure enough, very quickly, Arnott's realised they were going to have a major problem on their hand, uh, hands unless they were able to change and to guarantee the security of children, in this case, through their supply chain. So individual action can absolutely lead to change. So imagine if the 600 of us today said, right, we're going to bank with the bank that's doing its best to support and promote women. We're going to shop at the grocery store that can best demonstrate to us that it understands the need to be flexible and the need to support women and men to balance work and caring responsibilities. And we're going to invest only in companies that have taken a step towards advertising and promoting gender equality and reporting it at their AGM. It wouldn't be that hard for us. There are some companies out there doing some amazing work. And while formal indicators are being developed, what I'd suggest to you today is that we already know how many women each company has on their board, that we can find out relatively easily. 
we can find out how many women companies have in their leadership team. We can find out most of the time what companies are doing to promote flexibility and parental leave internally. And if we started to use our individual purchasing power, our individual decision-making power, to start to buy products, goods and services from those companies that were taking a step, what we'd find, magically, is the others would find highly qualified, highly skilled women for their boards pretty quickly. It's incredible how often I get told, well, the issue is we just don't have any women. But in about 10 years, when this pipeline comes through, we'll find some good women and then, then we'll have equality. There's a lot of good women out there. A lot of them are in the room today. And I think if we as individuals could take a level of responsibility for this issue, in the same way we have for environmental protection, in the same way we have to protect children, then we'd start to see a really big shift. Now, workforce participation and gender equality in Australia may not seem to you to be the burning platform of other inequality issues in this country. But what it is is a trigger and a measure for something much greater. We know that when women have economic security independently, they're less likely to experience violence. We know that when women have an education, they have fewer children, and that those children have better health and education outcomes. And we know that if we could close the workforce participation gap in this country alone, we'd increase GDP by something like 13%. That's more than the mining industry contributes to Australia. It is significant. It's a trigger and it's a measure. So today, while I hesitate to be on record saying that gender equality is like the little tree on the bottom of emails or we're still like the Tim Tam, what I would say to you is it's within all of our control to break the cycle of discrimination against women. And I hope that today we can put a stop to the fact that our daughters get paid less than our sons. Thank you.